In John 8.32, we have the words of Yeshua, our Savior. He says, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And that is a promise that he, that he makes, and we can count on his promises that he will fulfill it. Of course, the question we have is free from what? That means free from man-made religion and the doctrines and commandments of men. Yeshua, our Savior, did not come to this earth to start a new religion or another religion, another church, another denomination. He came to reveal the character of his Heavenly Father to the Jews and to us and to point us all back to the Torah of Moses. Don't forget, the fact that we believe something to be true does not make it true. Truth is truth whether we believe it or not. Truth stands on its own. Today's presentation is one of those that may be hard to take, hard to swallow, because of the way we have been taught. I first was confronted with this topic or question by Michael Root through his presentation, The Greatest Story Never Told, and then by Shauna Manfredine through her presentations, Daniel's 70 Week Prophecy and Three Layers. I used most of the information from her presentation, however, in an abbreviated form. I also did research on my own, which I included. However, if anyone wanted to dig deeper into the subject, I recommend that you get Shauna's series. And here is your contact information. Lighted Way Ministries, P.O. Box 742, Canyonville, Oregon, 97417. And the telephone number is 541-672-1514. All of my presentations are actually designed to inspire us individually to check things out ourselves, especially this one. Don't accept anybody's word, including mine. Now here is today's question. How long lasted Messiah's public ministry? here on earth? Was it three and a half years or something else? Do we really know? Does scripture tell us? The length of Yeshua's public ministry is really not a topic most Christians wonder about. They are universally taught that it was three and a half years long. What they do not realize without personal investigation is that this is only one traditional teaching of several possibilities ranging from one to three years in length. Here are some Christian assumptions regarding the Messiah's public ministry. Yeshua was baptized in 727 AD. Yeshua ministered for three and a half years from his baptism. He began his ministry at the age of 30. He died on a Friday Passover in 31 AD. Yeshua was resurrected on a Sunday morning before sunrise in 31 AD. It is not possible to follow Messiah's life precisely enough to place it on a calendar, as much of what he did is unwritten.
The first one to mention a three-year ministry might have been Oregon in commentary on Matthew, book 24, written late in his life, but Eusebius, early in the 4th century, was the first to argue for a three-and-a-half-year ministry, which is half a week, referring to the 70-week prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. He had no other arguments for his stand. Seventh-day Adventists, as an example, have the same arguments and teach a three-and-a-half-year public ministry. So let's go to Daniel's 70-week prophecy. We find that in Daniel 9, 24 to 27, it says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish their transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring an everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. That is a total of 69 weeks. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. That takes place after 62 weeks. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. At its essence, Daniel's 70-week prophecy is about the advent of the true Messiah exactly at the time appointed. We have three typical prophetic fulfillment. The first fulfillment of a Bible prophecy in the time of ancient Israel. The second fulfillment of a Bible prophecy in the time of Christ, Messiah, or the early church. And the final fulfillment of a Bible prophecy at the end of time. Our first example is Passover, layer number one. In Exodus 12, 6-12, it says, And ye shall keep it, meaning the Passover, the fourteenth day of the same month, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is Yahweh's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am Yahweh. So this here is ancient Israel fulfillment, the first layer. So let's go to Passover, layer number two. This is the time of the early church fulfillment. In John 18.38 it states, Pilate says unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again into the Jews, and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. In 1 Corinthians 5.7 Paul says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Messiah, our Passover, is sacrificed 
for us. So this is still Passover layer number two, fulfillment at the time of the early church. Passover layer number three, this is the end time fulfillment. It states in Luke 22, 15, with desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Let's go to our second example, the Elijah message, layer number one. We have the ancient Israel fulfillment. It states in 1 Kings 18.21, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If Yahweh be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Elijah message number two, layer two. This is the time of Messiah, early church fulfillment. It states in Matthew 17, 11 to 13, And Yeshua answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already, and they knew him not. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Now we come to layer number three in the Elijah message, the end time fulfillment. We read in Malachi 4, 1 to 6, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, says Yahweh of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statute and judgment. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahweh. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Here we have an overview of the 70 weeks uh, prophecy fulfilled. First, we have the first layer, which was in 457 BC, Artaxerxes commanded to restore and build Jerusalem. And the second layer of fulfillment was Messiah's baptism in 27 AD. And the gospel went to the Gentiles in 34 AD. And the third layer of fulfillment is the end time fulfillment. In the first layer, Daniel's 70-week prophecy identified the exact year Messiah would begin his ministry, and that was in 27 AD, prophetic time. It also foretold the end of probation for the Jewish nation in 34 AD. In the second fulfillment of this prophecy, it seems that the ministry of Messiah would continue for 490 literal days and not for three and a half years, as we have been taught to believe. From John's proclamation, Behold the Lamb of Elohim, to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, it was 70 literal weeks or 490 literal days in order to fulfill Daniel's prophecy of the second layer. That means a little more than one year, and not three and a half years, as we have been taught. In the next slide, we have a basic outline or drawing of the Daniel 9 prophecy of the 490-year fulfillment of the first layer. The Messiah was cut off after 62 weeks, 
not after 64 or 65 weeks. After 62 weeks would place him to about 28 AD. Here is the overview of the 490 years prophecy, which reaches actually from 457 BC when Artaxerxes gave the command to rebuild Jerusalem and ends at 34 AD. And then um, we have the seven weeks, the 62 weeks, which brings us to 27 AD when Yeshua was uh, baptized. So you probably have to take yourself some time and go through it very slowly to understand exactly um, what happened at that time. But everything uh, falls into place. If we uh, take uh, scripture and uh, confirm it with history. The early Christians believed in a one-year ministry. The support of a one-year ministry of Yahshua was widely known among the early church fathers in the generations after Paul. These followers placed the baptism of Yahshua in the 15th year of Tiberius and the crucifixion in the 16th year of his reign. Here we have the account in Luke 3, 1-3. Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip ruler of Iturea, and of the region of Trachonitis, and uh, Lysanias the ruler of Abilene. Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests, the word of God, came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. According to the Gospels of Mark, Matthew and Luke, these are the uh, synoptic Gospels, many biblical critical scholars would agree that Yahshua's public ministry seems no longer than a little over one year. Many prominent 2nd, 3rd and 4th century Christians, such as St. Clement of Alexandria, who lived between 150 and 211, 216, all the called for a one-year ministry. Early church leaders who believed in a one-year ministry included Tertullian, Lactantius, Philastrius, Gordentius, Evagrius, Orasius, and Ephraim. A one-year ministry. We read that in Peter, quoted in the Clementine homilies. Why did our teacher abide in discourse a whole year to those who were awake. Yeshua died at the age of 30. Ephraim of Syria resonates the 30th year death of Yeshua. We read it uh, from the Ephraim of Syria's Epiphany hymns. In the year that is the 30th, let them give thanks with us, the dead that have lived through his dying the living that were converted in his crucifixion, and the height and the death that have been reconciled in him. Blessed be he and his Father. Irenaeus admitted that many followers of the way, specifically mentions the church at Ephesus, preached a ministry of one year, and this was based on Yeshua's reading from Isaiah at the synagogue in Nazareth and proclaiming the favorable year of Yahweh. Afterwards, John, the disciple of Yahweh, who also had leaned upon his breast, did himself publish a gospel during his residence at Ephesus in Asia. This is taken from Eusebius.
According to the Gospel of Luke, Yeshua had a one-year ministry because in Luke, and only here, Yeshua at the beginning of his public life is quoting a passage of Isaiah which includes a reference to a one-year period. In Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, we find that interesting prophecy regarding the work of the Messiah. It states there, The Spirit of Yahweh is upon me, because Yahweh has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. to proclaim the acceptable year of Yahweh and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. That was in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Here is a fulfillment in his life, which we read in Luke chapter 4, 14 to 21. And as his custom was. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for the read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of Yahweh is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of Yahweh. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Luke 4, 14-21 He stopped reading Isaiah's prophecy in the middle of a sentence because the rest of Isaiah points to the day of vengeance or the day of judgment. Yeshua's ministry was to be a little over a year in length, 490 days or 70 weeks to be exact, and he came as a suffering servant, not yet as a judge. What about the Jubilee, the acceptable year of Yahweh? We read about the Jubilee in Leviticus 25.10. You shall thus consecrate the 50th year and proclaim a release through the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a Jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his own property, and each of you shall return to his family. What Jubilee meant in ancient times, these holy days, were eagerly anticipated and celebrated in joy and merriment. The sabbatical year, called in Hebrew the Shemitah year, are fully described in Exodus 23.10-11, in Leviticus 25.1-7, and Deuteronomy 15.1-6. The highlights are that once every seven years, the food-producing lands rest, and all debts are cancelled. After seven sabbatical years, on the 50th year is a jubilee year, called in Hebrew the Yovel, translated the ram's horn, or trumpet year, because the blowing of the shofar announced the year. See Leviticus 25, 8-55. The highlights are that the land has a second year's rest. The title of the land reverts back to its original owner, and all slaves are liberated. You can look this up under this website, homeworship101.com.
According to William Whiston's footnotes to Josephus, 24 B.C. was a sabbatical year and 23 B.C. was a jubilee year. This would mean that 27 C.E. was a sabbatical year and 28 C.E. was a jubilee year. In the next slide, we have a statement written by Ben Zion Wacholder. He was Professor Emeritus of Talmud and Rabbinics at Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati. Here is what he says. One of Wacholder's 10 historically documented land sabbaths ran from 27 to 28 AD. He believes that John the Baptist's messianic ministry naturally began on this land Sabbath. Waholder and other scholars show conclusively that Herod's conquest of Jerusalem took place at the end of the land Sabbath year in 36 BC. This is precisely nine land Sabbaths prior to the start of John the Baptist's ministry. When it is realized that 27 AD was the seventh and last land Sabbath of a jubilee cycle, it is all the more remarkable than that. This makes Yeshua's reference to the Jubilee in Luke 4.16 all the more literal. He truly was proclaiming the acceptable year of Yahweh. According to Josephus, 47-48 was a Sabbath year. Take away 21 years and you get 27 as a Sabbath year. So 28 AD was a jubilee year. Eusebius, the father of the church history, said 28 to 29 AD was a jubilee year. Have you ever wondered why there were so many people hanging around to hear John the Baptist preach? And why there were so many crowds available to listen to Messiah's sermons? According to Ben Zion Wacholders, sabbatical years fell in 13 to 14, 20 to 21, 27 to 28, and 34 to 35, and 28 to 29 was a jubilee year. Could it be that John and Yeshua began preaching? In 27 during a Sabbath year? If so, no farmers were planting or harvesting, meaning they had time to listen to the messages. No planting, no harvesting. What a coincident, or was it planned by Yahweh? This previous information in reference to the sabbatical years as well as the year of Jubilee was taken from the calendar of sabbatical cycles during the Second Temple and the early Rabbinic period, HUCA 44, 1973, and the calendar of Sabbath years during the Second Temple era, a response, HUCA 54, 1983, by Ben Wacholder. When we read the Gospels, we find out that there is a miracle that is recorded in every one of the Gospels. Which one was it? It was the feeding of the 5,000 men without women and children. We find that recorded in Matthew 14, 14 to 21, and in Mark 6, 34 to 44, and in Luke 9, 11 to 17, and in John 6, 5 to 13. This miracle takes place between Pentecost in John 5, 1, and the Feast of Tabernacles in John 7, 2, actually about two, three or four months before the Feast of Tabernacles.
even though there's a Passover listed in John 6, 4. Yeshua never goes up to Jerusalem at that time, which would have been required by the Torah. But he does feed 5,000 people with leavened bread. Five days later, he feeds another 4,000 people with leavened bread. He would have taught a whole synagogue full of people to be disobedient to the Torah and to stay around in Galilee instead of being up at Jerusalem. He would be violating the Torah if those words were in the original text. What about the Gospel record? The synoptic Gospel record, and by synoptic we mean uh, the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It says here, the synoptics predominantly Galilean account based on Mark represents Yeshua's mission as lasting approximately one year, beginning with a 40-day sojourn in the desert. And this is taken from this website down here. There are three Passovers in John. We have a Passover in 27 AD. Yeshua cleanses the temple. According to John 2.13, and the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Yeshua went up to Jerusalem. Then we have one in John 6.4. It says, and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. And then we have one in 28 AD, the next year, when Messiah died. In John 11.55, it says, and the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand. And many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Five feasts. Dr. Carpenter, Harmony of the Gospel states, admitting that our Lord's ministry included two Passovers only, we have records of his attendance at each of the festivals which occurred during his ministry. There are only five festivals at which we have distinct records of what Yeshua said and did. The first is the Passover which occurred after his baptism. The second is a feast at which he cured the infirm man at the pool of Bethesda, which must have been Pentecost, seven weeks after the Passover. The third is the Feast of Tabernacles. The fourth is the Feast of Dedication. The fifth, the Crucifixion Passover. And that's from Dr. Carpenter's Harmony of the Gospels, page 54. A Harmony of Synoptical Arrangement of the Gospels by Land Carpenter, 1835, says the following. The prevalent opinion during the first three centuries was the ministry of Christ lasted not more than a year and a few months. Influenced by this consideration and by the examination of the first three Gospels, Dr. Bentley adopted the bipartial system, first published in English in 1733. The one-year theory was also adopted by Clement of Alexandria and Oregon, among others. Oregon found no difficulty with John's Gospel because his text omitted at least the words, the Passover. And this is from Chronological Aspects of the Life of Christ by Harold Hörner, page 47. Here we have an added text. By adding the Passover in John 6, 4, admittedly not present in the oldest copies of Greek, translators would have us believe that nothing worth writing happened in Messiah's ministry from Pentecost, from John 5, 1, to Passover, John 6, 4. This is almost a year of relatively unrecorded ministry. Some modern scholars continue to pursue a one-year ministry. The main argument is that there was only a first and last Passover. 
The second Passover in John 6, 4 is claimed as neither primitive nor genuine. This claim is based primarily on the omission in Codex 472 in the library of Lambeth Palace, which dates to the 13th to the 15th centuries. This is from excerpts from Kenneth F. Doig, New Testament Chronology, Lewiston, New York, Edwin Mellon Press, 1990. The Unnamed Feast. In addition, some teach that the feast with no name mentioned in John 5.1 also refers to a Passover. Again, they want to make us believe that nothing worth writing happened from Passover in John 2.13 to the Passover in John 5.1. There's another year of unrecorded ministry. So let's not be deceived. John stands alone. Another evidence that John's second mention of Passover was added is that this Passover is not spoken of in any of the other Gospels. Matthew tells about the feeding of the 5,000 in Matthew 14, but nothing is said of it being a Passover. Mark tells about the feeding of the 5,000 in Mark 6, but nothing is said of it being a Passover. Luke tells about the feeding of the 5,000 in Luke 9, but nothing is said of it being a Passover. John 6, 4 is the only mention that the feeding of the 5,000 was at Passover. Now, other than Yeshua's last journey to Jerusalem, this leaves relatively Few verses in Matthew and Mark, none in Luke, that come between John 2 and John 12, a period of one to two years. So if one or two Passover feasts were placed between John 2 and John 12, this would leave huge time gaps in the synoptics when they related very little of Messiah's public ministry. That's how they tried to add about two years to John's Gospel by adding John 5.1, an unnamed feast, and John 6.4, another Passover. So what about the age of the Lamb? Is that important? Question, what is the meaning of the Lamb's age? Yeshua was represented by a lamb of the first year. In Numbers 29.2 it says, And ye shall offer a burnt offering, seven lambs of the first year without blemish. Number 6.12, And he shall bring a lamb of the first year for a trespass offering. So let's look at the Passover lamb. In Exodus 12.5-6 we read, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Another requirement of the law regarding the Passover lamb was that it be a lamb of the first year. If Yeshua was to be our Passover sacrifice, he too had to be a lamb of the first year. The first year cannot refer to his age, as we know that he was baptized of John and began his ministry when he began to be about 30 years of age, according to Luke 3.23. Our Messiah was indeed a lamb of the first year, and that for a year plus he had been holding forth the gospel of healing and deliverance and preaching about the kingdom of God, preaching the acceptable year of Yahweh. Support for a 490-day ministry, Daniel 9 prophecy wasn't all fulfilled the first time around. Clearly, there is another fulfillment. 
Typically, the middle fulfillment of a prophecy is fulfilled in the life of the Messiah. Isaiah's prophecy, which Yeshua said he was fulfilling, was for the acceptable year, singular, of Yahweh. The early church believed in a one-year ministry. This puts Messiah's ministry death at a jubilee. The next slide has a drawing of what Daniel 9 prophecy of the 490 days, the literal fulfillment would look like. Yeshua was baptized in the water in 27 AD, and exactly 490 days later in 28 AD, the baptism by fire, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, took place. So here we have the slide as mentioned, which has a drawing of a Daniel 9 prophecy of the 490 days the literal fulfillment would look like. Yeshua, our Savior, was baptized in water in 27 AD, and exactly 490 days later, as we can see, in the year of 28 AD, the baptism by fire, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, took place. So what does it tell us? It tells us that we can uh, trust our Heavenly Father because He has a plan, He has uh, a timeline, and everything will happen, and it's happening according to His forecast, according to His calendar. So let's trust Him all in these last days that uh, things will happen as He has promised, He's in control, He loves us, and He is um, going by his calendar and not by ours. In the next slide, I'm trying to give a brief or better overview of how the life of the Messiah may have looked like with actual dates. There's an overview of his public ministry. According to historical documents, the year 27 CE was a land Sabbath and the year 28 CE was a jubilee. Therefore, the death of the Messiah had to take place in the year of 28 CE, of the Common Era. We have a starting point with Yeshua's death and 28 CE of the Common Era as follows. March 28. Tuesday, Tekufa. April 15, 28 CE, Thursday, the next new moon after Tekufa. Then we have April 28, 28 CE, Wednesday, Passover, Crucifixion Day, the 14th day of the first month. April 29, in the year of 28 CE, Thursday, Unleavened Bread Sabbath. May 1, 28 CE, this is a Sabbath, the Resurrection Day, that's a weekly Sabbath. May 2, 28 CE, that would be Sunday, the first day of the week. We have first fruits. May 5, 28 CE, Wednesday, second unleavened bread Sabbath. May 14, 28 CE, Friday, the next new moon. June 20, 28 CE, Sunday, first day of the week, Pentecost. Now we can count back 490 days or 70 weeks in order to ascertain Yeshua's date of baptism. So when we count back 490 literal days from Pentecost, which should have been on June 20, 28 CE, we arrive at February 17, 27 CE of the Common Era, Monday, his baptism. Starting at his baptism, we can go forward to see what his schedule was. The same day he went into the wilderness, March 29, 27 CE, Sabbath, Yeshua leaves the wilderness, March 30, 27 CE, Sunday, first day of the week, Andrew, John, Peter, look at John 2, 1. April 1, 27 CE, Tuesday, Wedding at Cana, John 2, 1, 11. April 2 to 10, the year of 27, the Common Era, traveling to Jerusalem to Passover. April 11, 27 CE, Friday, Yeshua's first Passover. 
in his public ministry. April 12, 2017, Sabbath, the Unleavened Bread Sabbath. April 13, 2017, Sunday, the first day of the week, we have first fruits. April 18, 2017, Friday, Unleavened Bread Sabbath. Then June 1, 2017, Sunday, first day of the week, there's a Pentecost. September 19, in the year of 27, Common Era, Friday, Feast of Trumpets. And then September 28, 27 CE, Sunday, first day of the week, the Day of Atonement, the Transfiguration. See Matthew 17, 1-4 and Mark 9, 2-9. Now we can count back 490 literal days. We started October 327 of the Common Era, Friday, Feast of Tabernacle, Sabbath. October 527 CE, Sunday, the first day of the week, Yeshua goes to Jerusalem. October 6 and 7 of the same year, Monday and Tuesday, he teaches in the temple. See John 714. October 10, 27 CE, Friday, we have the second feast Sabbath, the eighth day. You can read that in John 7.37. October 11, 27 CE, Sabbath, healing of the blind men and the story of the adulterous woman. Now we get back to the year 28 CE. March 23, Tuesday, Tukufa. April 15, 28 CE. Thursday, the next new moon after Tekufa. April 28, Wednesday, Passover, Crucifixion Day, the 14th day of the first month. April 29, Thursday, Unleavened Bread, Sabbath. May 1, Sabbath, Resurrection Day. That's the weekly Sabbath. May 2nd, 28 CE, Sunday, first day of the week, First Fruits. May 5, Wednesday, 2nd Unleavened Bread Sabbath. May 14, Friday, the next new moon. June 20, Sunday, first day of the week, Pentecost. There we have the baptism by fire. This was a rough overview with the approximate dates of the public life of our Messiah of 490 literal days. Here we have another overview of his public ministry in their approximate sequence with the Gospel reference. On the left hand side, the event in his public ministry. On the right hand side, the appropriate Gospel references. And uh, you can take yourself time and go through each step and uh, go through all the Bible verses and see if uh, this makes any sense. Because we have the baptism of Messiah, temptations in the wilderness, and then these uh, Bible verses when it took place, the gathering of his disciples, the first miracles in Cana, in Galilee, first visit to Jerusalem, cleansing the temple, the first Passover, talking to Nicodemus, return to Galilee, the women of Samaria, return to Cana, return uh, to Jerusalem, to attend an unnamed feast, which actually was Pentecost, and then the healing at the pool of Bethesda. It continues on. Yeshua begins his Galilean ministry of preaching repentance. Yeshua rejected in his hometown of Nazareth. And on the right hand side, you have all the, uh, um, the references. Yeshua calls his disciples to begin following him full time. Yeshua chooses but 12 of his disciples to be his apostles. Sermon on the Mount, Yeshua sends out his 12 apostles on their first missionary mission. John the Baptist, beheading, Yeshua feeds the 5,000. Then we have Passover, John 6, 4, a feast of the Jews was nigh. But as we heard before, the term the Passover is not found in the oldest Greek manuscripts. We keep on going. Yeshua refused to have the crowds make him their king. Many disciples turned away. 
Then we have the um, Mount of Transfiguration, Yeshua at Feast of Tabernacles, the last great day, Yeshua closes his Galilean ministry. He is en route to Jerusalem to be crucified. The Feast of Dedication, which he attended. Yeshua raises Lazarus. Religious leaders plot to murder him. The final journey to Jerusalem. The crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. His last appearances to his disciples. And his ascension into heaven. Here is another detailed uh, overview of the 70-week ministry of the Messiah. And uh, I would recommend that you take yourself uh, some time and uh, stop your tape here and go through uh, all these details here. You have the Passover, you have Pentecost, you have the Feast of Trumpets, you have the Day of Atonement, you have Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacle, you have uh, Hanukkah, and then the second Passover when he was actually uh, put uh, on the tree and died for us. And then at the last you have the baptism by fire. So we have exactly 490 days from his uh, baptism by water to his baptism by fire. We need to realize that from the very start of Yeshua's public ministry, the religious leaders of that day were seeking to kill him, right from the beginning, right? The first mention of that plan to kill him, to put him out of the way, we find recorded in John 5, 17 to 18, after he had healed the impotent men at Pentecost. Here is John 5:17 to 18 it says but Yeshua answered them my father worketh hitherto and I work therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only had broken the sabbath but said also that God was his father making himself equal with God Do you realize that was right in the beginning of his public ministry that was actually less than two months after the first Passover in John chapter 2, verse 13. There was no way Yeshua would have lasted for three and a half years, and there was no need for him to continue his public ministry for such a long time. The next time the plan to kill the Messiah is mentioned in John chapter 7, 1. Here we have uh, what it says in Scripture. After these things, Yeshua walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. And then we have John 7, 2. Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. Then they were trying to stone Yeshua right after the Feast of Tabernacles in John 8, 59, and again after Hanukkah, in John 10, the verses 30 to 33. Here we have chapter 12, 10 to 11. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. Can you imagine that? Because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Yeshua. Then we are told in Matthew 26, 4, two days before the second Passover of his public ministry, then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people, consulted that they might take Yeshua by subtlety and kill him. The Jewish leadership was determined to kill him. Then scripture tells us in John 13, 27, that Satan entered into Judas Iscariot to deliver Yeshua to the authority to be crucified. Who was behind that plan to kill Yeshua according to scripture? It was Satan. He was uh, driving uh, Judas Iscariot 
And he was driving the uh, uh, Pharisees and Sadducees to kill the Messiah. Satan wanted to kill him already as a baby. That's why he inspired Herod to kill all the male children under the age of two, hoping that he will be one of them. For what reason? To kill the plan of redemption. Here is another question. Why would anyone want Yeshua to minister from 30 to 33? Having the Messiah begin his ministry at 30 and end it at 33 had to do with the mingling of the sun worship, Christ with the biblical true Messiah. Let's remember the words in Matthew 24, 4, For there shall arise false messiahs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. The number 33 is a number that connects directly with the zodiac and the movement of the sun around it. As we can see here, three years sun worship. Now this is from uh, taken from this uh, website down here, Paganizing Faith of Yeshua. The sun takes 2,160 years to pass backwards to one sign of 30 degrees of a sign of the zodiac. Now this number 2160, or its shorter version of 216, is a number that turns up in megalithic construction throughout the world. It was encoded into most of the Cyclopean structures to represent the serpent or site real cults, who were the Magi or the astrologers. Now it takes 2160 years for the sun to clear a house as we have seen. In degrees this is 30, but the sun enters at the 30th degree, but is not totally clear under the 33rd degree as it is of a certain size also. Astrology creeps in. Is this why the New Testament says the ministry of the Christ begins at 30 and finishes at 33? Here again from this website, Paganizing Faith of Yeshua, it states, Today we have lost this knowledge, but if read, by one of the ancient priests of Egypt, or even one of the early Gnostic Jew or Gentile Gnostics. This would not have escaped their attention. This reference would have been unmistakable to anyone aware of the secret of astrology. The number is connected to the initiation of the Sun God, not the Son of God, passing through the Zodiac. Turn to lies. We have the answer in 2 Timothy 4, 3-4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. False apostles will preach another Jesus another spirit, another gospel, which ye have not received from us. These are the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 11.4. Question, are we talking about a Greek Jesus? A Greek Messiah? It was around in Paul's day, Galatians 4, uh, 1, 6 to 7 some of you have embraced another gospel, which is not another gospel, but rather a perversion of the gospel of Messiah.
A perverted gospel is teaching something different than that proclaimed by the apostles, by the first century church. Satan knows that the truth, received in the love of it, sanctifies the soul of the receiver. Therefore, he is constantly seeking to substitute false theories, fables, another gospel. Question. Do we have the truth? Do we have the right gospel? My friend, time is running out. Let's make sure we have and follow the right gospel. That is my sincere prayer. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom.